the Kennedy family is one of the most famous families in American history and arguably one of the most cursed, but that's a video for another day. When asked to think about the Kennedy family, you might immediately think about John F. Kennedy and his wife Jackie. And while they might be the most recognizable members of their family, the Kennedys were famous long before JFK became the 35th president of the United States. For the most part, the Kennedy family lived their lives openly in the public eye. You could say they were America's version of a royal family. Now, every family has their secrets and there's no doubt the Kennedys had a few. But perhaps one of their darkest secrets was that they had their eldest daughter, Rosemary Kennedy, lobotomized and institutionalized for decades. Today, we're going to be talking about the forgotten Kennedy sister who disappeared from public view at just 23 years old. I'm Brooke and this is Armchair Investigator. As you're watching the episode, be sure to let me know your thoughts on it. In order to tell you about Rosemary Kennedy and her tragic story, I first need to tell you about her family. Rosemary is the sister of John F. Kennedy, and their father was Joe Kennedy Sr. He was a businessman, investor, and politician in Boston, while their mother Rose was a philanthropist and socialite. Her father served as a state senator, a U.S. congressman, and was the mayor of Boston. Joe and Rose were married in 1914 and had nine children together. Their first child, Joseph Patrick Kennedy Jr., was born on July 25, 1915. John Fitzgerald was born on May 29, 1917. Rose Marie, who was named after her mother and later called Rosemary, was born on September 13, 1918. Kathleen was born on February 20, 1920. Eunice was born on July 10, 1921. Patricia was born on May 6, 1924. Robert was born on November 20, 1925. Jean Anne was born on February 20, 1928. Edward Moore, a.k.a. Ted, was born on February 22, 1932. Now, if Rosemary's entry into this world was any indication as to how her life would play out, let's just say she was in for a tough ride. You see, when Rosemary was born, World War I was still ongoing, all while the Spanish influenza was making its way around the world, killing millions. It was the most severe influenza outbreak of the 20th century. The CDC estimated that about 500 million people, or one-third of the world's population, became infected with the virus. It's believed that at least 50 million people worldwide died from it, with about 675,000 deaths occurring in the United States. This meant medical resources were stretched thin. Think along the lines of how things were at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, when hospitals and healthcare workers were overloaded. Throughout Rose's pregnancy with Rosemary, she remained thankful that she and her family stayed healthy through the Spanish flu pandemic and was optimistic about the delivery. So the day Rose went into labor, she expected a smooth, easy, at-home delivery, just like she had with her first two children. But due to all the sick, her doctor wasn't able to come right away. No doctors could. If you know anything about birth, babies don't wait. Soon, baby Rosemary was in the birth canal, and Dr. Good still hadn't arrived. For whatever reason, the nurse decided against delivering the baby herself. Instead, she had Rose squeeze her legs together, and even went as far as to push baby Rosemary's partially exposed head back into the birth canal for two excruciating hours, depriving little Rosemary of oxygen. When the doctor finally arrives, he delivers baby Rosemary and pronounces her healthy. But that wasn't entirely true, and the complications of her birth would cause her serious repercussions for the rest of her life. Now, if you're thinking this was simply a case of ignorance and unknowing on the medical world's behalf, you'd be wrong. At that time, it was well understood that preventing the movement of a baby through the birth canal could cause a lack of oxygen and subject the baby to brain damage and physical disabilities. It's never entirely understood why the nurse didn't deliver the baby herself. Photos of Rosemary show her as a happy and alert baby. When Rosemary was a year and a half old, Joe and Rose welcomed a second daughter, Kathleen. 
and that's when Rosemary's developmental delays became noticeable. As Rosemary failed to reach development milestones as a toddler, it became evident that something was wrong. Rosemary lacked coordination and struggled to walk and hold on to things. In fact, she crawled, stood, took her first steps, and said her first words late. Her parents noticed she couldn't get the hang of childhood sports as easy as her siblings could, nor could she write as well as them. Rose could see that Rosemary was struggling with tasks that other children weren't. Rose said, I realized at an early age that Rosemary was not like the others. And even though Rosemary was still very young and hadn't been diagnosed with anything, the thought of having a child with disabilities was overwhelming for her parents. Her parents consult doctors and psychologists for a cure, but medicine hadn't yet made the advancements it has today. Specialists told them that her development was due to oxygen deprivation suffered as a result of a uterine accident. Concerned with the family's image, Joe and Rose tried to hide Rosemary's condition. At the time, there was such a stigma around disabilities. Just think back to all the horrible names and terms that were used. Rosemary's nephew, Tim Shriver, wrote in his 2014 memoir, they tried to hide Rosemary's condition from their friends and even from Rosemary herself. There would have been people who might have whispered about bad blood in the family. They also believed Rosemary would be happier if kept unaware of how different she was, but the code of silence led Rosemary to become confused and frustrated when she couldn't keep up. Rosemary's father, Joe, couldn't bear the thought of Rosemary being different. In his eyes, different meant being excluded from things like clubs, jobs, and opportunities. Growing up as an Irish Catholic in Boston, he often felt discriminated against and excluded. He didn't want his kids going through the same things he did. There was a good deal of pressure on Rosemary to excel academically and athletically, just like all of her other siblings. In 1923, when Rosemary was five years old, she was enrolled in kindergarten at the Edward Devotion School, just as her two older brothers had been. Rosemary's teachers labeled her deficient, meaning she was lagging behind her peers. Back then, there weren't really any specialized programs available, nor were there things like individualized education plans to meet the different needs of students like we see today. Joe and Rose hoped that her teachers could help Rosemary catch up, but by the spring of 1924, Rosemary's teachers refused to promote her to first grade, meaning she would repeat kindergarten the following year. She would also end up repeating first grade. By the time Rosemary was enrolled in second grade, her younger sister Kathleen would be joining her. Rosemary was nine years old. Other kids her age were entering the fourth grade. Rightly so, school left Rosemary feeling frustrated and anxious. She had a tendency to write from right to left instead of left to right, a phenomenon called mirror writing. She struggled to shape her letters and she couldn't write in a straight line unless using lined paper. Rose and Joe removed Rosemary from public school and instead hired tutors to give her private lessons at home in hopes she'd advance with her age group through school. Her mother took her to experts in mental deficiency but their assessments and recommendations left Rose discouraged. The IQ test was a relatively new assessment being used in the United States. Rosemary's IQ was said to be quote unquote low, but nobody seemed to know what to do with the information from these evaluations. Methods for diagnosis, education, and treatment were underdeveloped at the time. It's also believed that she suffered from intermittent epileptic seizures. Now, educating Rosemary at home wasn't as ideal as they hoped it would be. It was hard for Rosemary to watch her siblings go off to school every day, and Rosemary didn't understand why she couldn't go too. After a year of private lessons at home, when Rosemary was 11, her parents made the decision to send her to private boarding school in Pennsylvania called the Devereux School. And other than the distance, the school seemed like the perfect fit. The school was created for children with intellectual disabilities and provided specialized lesson plans for its students. The school was considered very successful with the work they did. For a time, it seemed like Rosemary was thriving. Her coursework included spelling, math, grammar, reading comprehension, art, music, sewing, and drama. 
Her teachers believed she was making the necessary adjustments to boarding school, showed excellent social poise, and was quite charming. They believed that Rosemary's low self-esteem and low self-confidence were major hurdles to her success. Poor Rosemary would often become impatient, irritated, and frustrated when she struggled with her schoolwork. All she wanted to do was make her parents proud. In one letter to her father, she wrote, I would do anything to make you so happy. I hate to disappoint you in any way. And in another letter writing, I am working hard, mother, because I get 100 in arithmetic all the time. In the fall of 1932, after three years at the Devereux School, Rosemary was sent to Elmhurst, the convent of the Sacred Heart School in Providence, Rhode Island, after her parents felt that the education she was receiving at Devereux was no longer benefiting her. By the end of her second year at Elmhurst, after reportedly making no progress whatsoever, she was enrolled in another private academy called Miss Newton School. Getting moved to all these different schools was so hard on Rosemary, as it would be for many of us. I know my anxiety would be through the roof. She's away from home, living with people she's never met, and nothing is familiar or a comfort to her. She went to three different schools over the course of five years. Each school was a new adjustment, a new living situation, a new learning environment. It would take Rosemary weeks to adjust. But Rosemary seemed to really enjoy her time at Miss Newton School. She loved the variety of classes available and even took French. She was receiving individualized teaching and a lot of oversight and attention. Her teachers realized she couldn't tolerate academic lessons after lunch, so instead they taught her other skills like weaving. It proved beneficial. Rosemary seemed more alert and her handwriting was improving. She was making friends, going to dances, and playing badminton. She was near her grandparents, aunts and uncles, and close friends of the family who would come and get her on the weekends. This is when Rosemary really seems to blossom. She's going out to the movies, shopping, skating, getting her hair done, attending game nights, doing things that a teenage girl would. Even though Rosemary was thriving socially, after two years at Miss Newton's school, Rosemary was denied admission for a third year of instruction. Her teachers felt there was no more they could do to help her progress in her education. Rosemary was then enrolled at Miss Horgan's residence school in Manhattan. It was a rigorous program and despite years of instruction, Rosemary had advanced only to a fifth grade level in math and English, despite being 18 years old. Rosemary would not return for a second year there. Instead, she would be sent to Sacred Heart Convent Academy for the 1937-1938 school year. When Rosemary's father, Joe, was appointed U.S. Ambassador to Britain in 1938, the family went to live in London, and Rosemary was enrolled at Belmont House, a boarding school ran by Catholic nuns who utilized Montessori education. A method of teaching developed in the early 1900s, which focuses on learning through fostering independence and student-led learning. It aimed to develop all aspects of a student, social, emotional, physical, and academic. Rosemary thrived. She flourished under the guidance of the nuns, who basically trained her to be a teacher's aide. These were some of the best years of Rosemary's life. She truly loved being at Belmont, so much so that she pleaded with her father to let her stay another year. At that time, however, during World War II, German forces were making their way across Europe, and by the end of May in 1940, they were advancing on Paris. Rosemary's parents wanted her back home with them in the States. This was an adjustment that Rosemary found difficult. She missed her British friends and the nuns at Belmont House. She missed having a purpose and feeling needed in her work. And once again, she found it hard to fit in with her siblings and keep up with them, whether it was playing sports as a family or talking politics around the dinner table. She noticed she didn't get the same freedoms as her younger siblings. It was hard on her. She would often ask her mother, why can't I do what Kathleen is doing? Her siblings were growing up around her, leaving home, starting their lives, finding careers, but Rosemary was hidden. 
no one spoke to her about her passions and interests, getting married or starting a family. She quickly regressed. It was as if all the progress she had made at Belmont House had vanished. She began lashing out at those around her, especially her family. In one incident, she began attacking her grandfather, hitting and kicking him, and she didn't stop until she was pulled away. Her parents had put so much focus on improving her academically, but they neglected to deal with her emotional and mental issues. After more failed attempts at various boarding schools, Rosemary's mother began looking into having her committed to a psychiatric hospital. Rosemary's younger sister Eunice had said that Rosemary was becoming increasingly more emotional, high-strung, and had temper tantrums. It's believed Rosemary dealt with more than just intellectual disabilities. It's likely she also suffered from mental illness. Today, modern mental health professionals believe she was most likely autistic. In 1940, one last attempt was made at St. Gertrude's School of Arts and Crafts, a convent school in Washington, D.C., before sending Rosemary to a psychiatric hospital. St. Gertrude's provided programs for intellectually and developmentally delayed and handicapped children, while also serving as a training ground for nurses and social workers. And while the school only enrolled girls ages 7 through 12, Joe and Rose paid tuition for Rosemary to function more as a teacher's aide. During that time, however, it was noted that there was a noticeable decline in Rosemary's mental and physical stability, and her customary good nature gave way to rising tension and irritability. Her fits of rage became more and more frequent. She experienced violent mood swings and would often defy the nuns, the staff, and the rules. She started sneaking out in the middle of the night, only for the nuns to find her walking around the streets of DC at 2 a.m. The nuns would bring her back, clean her up, and put her to bed. In the words of a fellow student who went on to speak about the many years of Rosemary's later confinement said, Rosemary would sneak out to meet men in taverns, men who were happy to give her attention, comfort, and sex. Her late night escapades left her vulnerable to sexual exploitation and they weren't sure who she was meeting up with. This was a huge deal to her parents. Neither of them wanted any of their kids talked about in the tabloids in any negative way. It clearly wouldn't be a good look for the Polish Kennedy family. By 1941, the family felt Rosemary's behavior had become too much of a liability for the family's political, financial, and social aspirations. Rosemary's oldest brother, Joe Jr., was about to begin his career in politics at the time, and JFK would soon start as well. They didn't want to risk the publicity from an unwanted pregnancy, venereal disease, or have Rosemary end up in any type of compromising situations. Rose and Joe were having a tough time finding convents and boarding schools to accommodate Rosemary, who was now 22 had the mental age of an 8- to 12-year-old, and was deemed intellectually disabled and emotionally troubled. St. Gertrude's was reluctant to have her back for another semester. They were worried she'd become a bad influence on the other students. Increasing worry over the family's reputation and concerns about Rosemary's safety led the family to learn about an experimental brain operation for the treatment of serious mental health conditions, a lobotomy. More specifically, a prefrontal lobotomy, a new psychosurgical operation that involved drilling holes in the skull, sticking a long, sharp instrument through the holes, and cutting the connective tissue linking the frontal lobes to the rest of the brain. And get this, patients were awake during the operation. They had to be in order to allow the physician to monitor the effects of each surgical cut to the brain. A review of the landmarks on the skull and the more significant structures in the frontal lobe will give one a clear impression of the nature of the operation. On the prepared skull, at a point 13 centimeters behind the gabella, the coronal suture is outlined. Six centimeters above the zygoma in the coronal suture, the opening is made. The patient is lying on the table with his head shaved back as far as the vertex. The first mark is made three centimeters behind the lateral rim of the orbit. Another mark is made in the midline, 13 centimeters from the glabella. These points are joined by a line leading over the vertex 
following as accurately as possible the coronal suture. The midline is similarly indicated. Surgeon inserts the leucotone into the brain. He is guided by the neurologist in order to keep the brain incision constantly in the plane of the coronal suture. It is when these remaining fibers are being severed that the patient often becomes disoriented. When the operation has been completed on both sides, the surgeon injects a few drops of iodized oil into the upper and lower extremities of the incision in order to demonstrate by x-ray their exact location. This is of importance since a failure of the operation can often be correlated with the erroneous placement of the incision. No, thank you. At the time, the procedure had only been in practice in the United States for less than five years and fewer than 100 patients had undergone the surgery. 80% of the patients were women. When it was first introduced, the lobotomy was held as a cure-all for things like depression, mental illness, hyperactive behavior, alcoholism, schizophrenia, OCD, chronic pain, bipolar and other mood disorders, homosexuality, drug addiction, nymphomania, violent behavior, and more. Proponents of the procedure claimed it made patients calmer, more docile, less spontaneous and aggressive, and much easier to control. Newspapers describe the procedure as easier than curing a toothache. In reality, evidence suggested that the surgery was risky, unreliable, and often damaging. Even the American Medical Association was strongly advising against this experimental procedure until more studies could be done on it. Ask the family members of someone who had received a lobotomy, and many would tell you it left their loved one soulless. Rosemary's sister Kathleen would end up conducting her own research on it. Reporting back on her findings, she said, Oh, mother, no, it's nothing we want done for Rosie. Despite all this, in November of 1941, Joe took matters into his own hands and quickly arranged for Rosemary to undergo the operation without consulting his wife or anyone else in the family. Her mother knew nothing. I cannot imagine, as a parent, finding out that my child has had any type of procedure done without me knowing about it and without me being there. I can't even imagine how devastating that probably was for Rose once she did find out what happened. And nobody knows if he even told Rosemary that she was getting a lobotomy. Not that she could have done anything about it anyways. Plus, informed consent wasn't even a thing back then. The procedure was carried out at George Washington University Hospital in upstate New York by Dr. James Watts. Rosemary's head was shaved to the top of her skull. She was strapped to an operating table, again, all while being kept awake for the surgery. And back then, prefrontal lobotomies took about an hour to perform. That feels like a lifetime when it comes to having any type of medical procedures done. No, thank you. Local anesthesia was used to numb the area around her temples, where two holes would be drilled, one on each side. Safe to say the procedure was terrifying for everyone. Just put yourself in the shoes of anyone having this procedure done. Not only are you getting strapped down, you're having your head shaved, you're kept awake, you can't see much of anything around you because of the surgical drapes, and much like going to the dentist, you hear drilling noises, you can hear the suction machine, not to mention the spark of being cauterized. Absolutely horrifying. According to Dr. Watts and his partner, Dr. Freeman, some of the patients would tell them they wanted to die right then and there. It was so bad, they would have gladly taken death over the procedure. I can't imagine anyone was voluntarily saying, yeah, sign me up. The doctors asked Rosemary to sing songs like God Bless America, recite prayers and poems, tell stories, and name the months of the year as they cut into her brain. In what would be the fourth and final cut, she became incoherent and then slowly stopped talking. The attending nurse was said to have been so traumatized by what she saw that she quit nursing altogether. Within hours, the doctors knew the surgery wasn't successful. In fact, it had gone horribly wrong. It would leave Rosemary almost completely disabled. Even after years of therapy, she could utter no more than a few words, and she would never recover the full use of her arms and legs. One leg and foot turned inward, making it difficult for her to walk, and she would only regain partial use of one of her arms. The doctors ordered her to have no visitors, 
because they felt that it could disrupt and confuse her. The operation destroyed a crucial part of Rosemary's brain and erased years of emotional, physical, and intellectual development, leaving her completely incapable of taking care of herself. On occasion, she would show small signs of progress, but it always vanished. Anissa, the family, would later say they knew right away that it wasn't successful. You could see by looking at her that something was wrong, for her head was tilted and her capacity to speak was almost entirely gone. Now, following a lobotomy, patients could experience a plethora of post-operative reactions and symptoms, including, but not limited to, drowsiness, uncontrollable vomiting, incontinence, restlessness, uncontrollable laughing or crying, needing help with eating, and other basic activities of daily living like showering and getting dressed. These symptoms could last days, weeks, months, years, or persist for life. The procedure that was being touted as a cure-all for mental illness? Yeah, not so much. Listen to this. According to Dr. Freeman's and Dr. Watts' own records and published papers, many of their patients became more belligerent and less able to engage in positive social interactions. Some became void of emotion altogether to the detriment of their relationships. Some became forgetful, self-absorbed, while others would go on to develop OCD, insomnia, and have seizures. According to a 2013 research paper, roughly 60,000 lobotomies were performed in the United States and Europe over 20 years. Thankfully, by the 1950s, medications like antipsychotics and antidepressants began to replace lobotomies. But for Rose, the damage was done. Her autonomy, as little as it had been, was over. She could no longer take care of herself. For a short time, she recovered at the hospital where she'd had the operation done. Later, she was transferred to a private psychiatric facility called Craig House, located 50 miles north of New York City. Costing more than $50,000 per year for treatment, it was where the wealthy placed their disabled, addicted, or mentally ill family members. Rosemary's father arranged for her to have extra nurses and personal attendants to care for her, costing an additional $2,400 per month. Craig House was known for providing the best treatments and amenities available at that time, yet there was nothing that could be done for Rosemary. The lobotomy left her with the mental capacities of a toddler and requiring round-the-clock care. During the seven years that Rosemary resided at Craig House, nobody came to visit her besides her father, and he went maybe a handful of times. Arrangements for the bills and other payments were dealt with by his secretary. Rosemary was then transferred to the St. Coletta School for Exceptional Children in Wisconsin. Joe had a cottage specifically built for her and her caretakers on the grounds. She would live hidden away for 63 years. If anyone asked about Rosemary, Joe and Rose told everyone that she was teaching at a school for handicapped students in the Midwest. They even told their youngest daughter, Jean, who was 13 at the time, that Rosemary had moved away and was a teaching assistant. Eunice claims that she didn't know where Rosemary was for over a decade. And I think maybe what's worst of all is that Rosemary's own mother didn't go see her for 20 years after the lobotomy. And here's the thing, Rosemary never forgot who her family was. So when Rose did eventually visit her, Rosemary saw her and began beating on her mother's chest while sobbing. So, so incredibly sad. For years, she was there with nobody from her family visiting her, and she remembered who they were. She had to have been wondering where they were and why they abandoned her. This was extremely hard for Rose to deal with, and having all that guilt on top of it, Rose would often leave her visits with Rosemary looking visibly upset. It's so heartbreaking when you think about how Rosemary goes from being a functional gal who can really do so much for herself. She really can. I mean, in one of her letters, she's talking about a trip to France and how she got on three planes all by herself. Her and her sister were presented to King George VI and Queen Elizabeth at Buckingham Palace, and she learned all of the required etiquette for the occasion. She's deemed beautiful and charming by the press. The newspapers plaster her photographs all over their front pages. She's finding meaningful work and 
Then suddenly she's transformed into someone who can no longer walk or talk. All of the devastatingly hard work she had to put in over the years, the different boarding schools, tutors, and private lessons just wiped away. The years that were sacrificed away from her family, all for nothing. I will say, if there's any silver lining to be taken from this, she really did have the best life she could at St. Coletta's. The nuns became her family, she had friends, a consistent caretaker, a cottage. She was loved and cared for well. She had a dog and a bird. Her father provided a car for her so that the nuns could take her anywhere she wanted to go. And after her father, Joe, died, her family came to see her often. Rosemary died on January 7, 2005 at the age of 86 with Eunice, Jean, Pat, and Ted by her side. Due to what happened to Rosemary, her siblings started campaigning for disability rights. JFK approved the first major legislation to combat mental illness and improve the quality of life for Americans with disabilities. Ted Kennedy was on the board of the American Association of People with Disabilities and pushed the introduction of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Eunice founded the Special Olympics and Jean started VSA, Very Special Arts, an international nonprofit organization dedicated to providing access to the arts for people with disabilities. Even though we still have a long way to go, Rosemary's story helped make sure people living with disabilities are better protected and looked after. A beautiful legacy, but one that's filled with so much unnecessary pain and suffering. I do believe her parents wanted her to have the best life possible and access to the best schools and facilities, but at the same time, there's no denying their decisions were also fueled by protecting the Kennedy image. I can't for the life of me figure out why Joe immediately jumped for the decision to lobotomize Rosemary. There's no doubt he knew about the risks, and with other treatments available to try out first, like electroshock therapy, hydrotherapy, insulin shock therapy. I'm not saying these were any better, but they sure were less aggressive than operating directly on someone's brain. I know I've given you a lot to unpack today, but I cannot wait to hear your thoughts. Were you aware of Rosemary Kennedy or her story? If you enjoyed today's investigation, give it a thumbs up and hey, while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss out on the next investigation. <laughs> Bye, Rosie. Come on, Jack. Another one, Jack. Another one, Jack. What? Get up and up.